watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following and by viewers like you. As I'm sure many of you know, there is an increasing, growing concern in the Jewish community, especially among many Jewish leaders, that there is in some way disharmony between the Obama administration and the way it is affecting and looking at and dealing with the state of Israel. Two recent events have exacerbated the situation. One having to do with Israel's announcement of building housing units in Ramat Shlomo, which was announced during Vice President Biden's trip to Israel. And there's feeling in the Jewish community there was a, a serious overreaction by the United States to that announcement. Ramat Shlomo is part of United Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel basically since the 1967 war and the redrawing of the boundaries of Jerusalem. From the American administration's perspective, Ramat Shlomo is in the part of Jerusalem that used to be occupied by Jordan and on the what is now called the West Bank. And so the American administration felt it was inappropriate for Israel to be building housing even if it was in the city of Jerusalem because it was on the West Bank and ultimately there is a, an attempt to create some kind of compromise, hopefully a compromise, if there ever is a two-state solution that will deal with territories on the West Bank. But many Jewish, many in the Jewish community felt there was a serious overreaction by the American administration to this announcement. And then on March 23rd, Prime Minister Netanyahu visited the White House. And there are reports that he was seriously snubbed by the president and that he wasn't treated properly. There were no photographs taken. He was asked to leave from the back door. The president left him to go to dinner with his family. And in general, there's a question as to whether there's a new style of American diplomacy relating to Israel's relationship with the United States. In this context, there was a dramatic, I would even say a courageous letter published in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, it also appeared in the Jerusalem Post. It was a letter purchased space in which this letter was to President Obama, and it was from the President of the World Jewish Congress. The World Jewish Congress has a letter, an open letter, in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post, in essence, saying to the President, Mr. President, we are worried about the relationship between the U.S. and Israel, and in certain ways, we don't think you understand the situation. That letter was penned by one of the most remarkable Jewish leaders on the world Jewish scene today, a man who served as an ambassador to Austria for this country. He has served the United States of America in the halls of government, diplomacy, and then he became has become over the last, I don't know, 20 years, one of the most creative Jewish leaders on the world Jewish scene. He basically saved and resurrected Central and Eastern European Jewry. He has served as the president of the, he served as the chairman of the Conference of Presidents. He's president of the JNF, Jewish National Fund, and he now is the president of the World Jewish Congress, and it is his name that is over this open letter to President Obama. And once again, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Ronald Lauder, Ambassador Lauder. And Ronald Lauder, thank you so much for being willing to share some time with us and to really talk about the letter that you wrote to the president. Mark, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, and I love your introduction. Uh, couldn't be said better. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. all the compliments. Thank, well, you've earned them. But the, the real aspect, the first thing you said was that there's been unease among 
many Jewish leaders yes. and what Before, was happening. I want to read one set. I want to read a little bit of what you wrote. It Thank may you. be that not all of our viewers saw your letter. Right. Let me read a moment, portion right. of it, and then you comment. This is the this is from the letter that Ron Lauder wrote, open letter published in the Washington Post, Bruce, and the uh, Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal to the president. It goes like this. Mr. President, we are concerned about the dramatic deterioration, I want to say that again, the dramatic deterioration of diplomatic relations between the United States and Israel. I submit most respectfully, Ronald Lauder writes, that it is time to end our public feud with Israel and to confront the real challenges that we face together. And I w want to just ask you, you know, I want to know what public feud you're referring to, and I want you to describe how bad you really think this is, that you would use these words, dramatic deterioration. How bad is it, and what is the feud that you see? Well, the most important fact is that it's a public feud. Um, and the fact is that there's been many disagreements between Israel and the United States, as there is between any great allies or great friends. But this is the first time that I've seen something as public as this. Mm -hmm. And um, I happened to be in Washington uh, during the time that Prime Minister Netanyahu um, gave his speech at um, the APAC meeting and then had an evening meeting with the president. And I'm not going to go into what happened, but it was a very, very, uh, I wouldn't say contentious, but a very difficult meeting. It was the first time I can remember that there were no, there was no photographs taken. Um, there was, it was done in such a way that the prime minister left the White House. Really, I, I don't know use the word snub, but it was a very, very difficult meeting. And the fact is, but that was not public. Uh, what what was that public? That was not public. I was watched. I was watching on um, a different network. Um, what was happening? And we could see the pres We could see the prime minister leaving. But the fact is that it was very known everywhere that it was not a very popular meeting. And there was no photography done. There was no joint press conference. There was nothing. And the result is that when the various countries, be it Iran or be it other moderate country companies in the Middle East, see a rift between the United States and Israel, whatever the reason is, they take that as a question of saying, aha, now the United States is not behind Israel. It's our chance to take advantage of this. And instead of helping the peace process, it hurts the peace process because the peace process is about a feeling that there's no choice but to come together. Mm -hmm. The minute they feel that the United States may not be as firmly behind the uh, whole question of Israel and the whole, uh, whole agreement that had in the past between the various governments, we have a problem. But the most serious problem was this incident or whatever, this faux pas made by the Israeli government during the, pre the visit of pre uh, Vice President Biden. What people don't realize is that in order to build in this neighborhood, Bamash Shlomo, it has to, it's a seven stage process. It has to have seven permits. These permits are done over a period of time. This was the fourth permit. There was nothing more than a signing of one more permit in the bureaucracy. This is an area that will not be built for another two to three years, if at all. And the real question is, what was this big incident? Why did the United States make such a big deal of I this? believe that the United States made a big deal of it because this was a perfect opportunity to put pressure on Israel about a subject that Israel did not want pressure about. It was about, it was about Jerusalem, East Jerusalem in particular. Under any conceivable plan, this neighborhood is an entirely Jewish neighborhood, would never be part of any Palestinian. But this was a chance, I believe, for the administration to show the Arab world that they were being tough on Jerusalem. You know, it was interesting. Um, before uh, President Obama uh, became President Obama, when he was still Senator Obama and looking for the nomination, he made a brilliant speech at APAC. 
During that speech, he talked about Jerusalem being undivided. And I believe he got a standing ovation for that, if I remember correctly. Interestingly enough, after some pressure the next day from the Arab countries, he recanted. That's and he correct. said, it's not, it's, I, I changed my mind. Mm -hmm. And I realized then that Jerusalem, the eternal capital of Jewish people, was in play. And it's an impossible situation. You mentioned before it's been the capital of Israel since um, basically the founding of the state. It's been the capital of Israel for 3,000 years. And it's part of us. Um, as Elie Wiesel talk, says in his um, wonderful piece uh, that he wrote, there were 600 mentions um, about Jerusalem in the scriptures. There is not one mention about Jerusalem in, in the Quran. So again, it's a very, very contentious thing. Also, when Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke about settlements, which was the first time anyone had the guts to do it, and he stopped the settlements, and George Mitchell even said this was a very, very important statement. At the APAC, at the APAC speech, he said, Jerusalem is not a settlement. This is not a settlement. Of course. This is Jerusalem. This is the capital city. What country in the world would take their capital city and divide it? I can't imagine one. Are you saying, by the way, that it is inconceivable to you that there could be a peace worked out between the Israelis and the Palestinians that would allow the Palestinians to have their capital in East Jerusalem? Is that inconceivable to you? It's conceivable, and one of the suggestions made which um, I don't know how I feel about it, was the concept of keeping Jerusalem as one city. It, it's, by the way, it's, it's a place where not only Jews, but Christians and Muslims can worship freely. And it's one of the few cities that, that happen. And there's no other city in the Middle East like that. Uh, but the fact is that you could have a settlement where, and again, this is not putting forth as an idea, but just uh, was uh, said to me, um, that you can have a city with two town halls, one in East Jerusalem, one in West Jerusalem, and, uh, and let, the two, let the town hall in East Jerusalem um, administer for the um, Arab population, but have one city. To divide a city is a very, very difficult situation. Okay, I want to press you just one more moment. Are you saying it is inconceivable to you that a portion of East Jerusalem be carved out to be the capital, the sovereign capital of a Palestinian state. Is that inconceivable? Or do you say to yourself, within the notion of negotiations for real peace, and I'm talking about real peace, for real peace, you could see the Israeli people and an Israeli government saying, we retain virtually all of Jerusalem, we retain control of the old city, which is on the West Bank. Most Jews don't even think of it that way. The old city of Jerusalem was under Jordanian control prior to 67. It is West Bank. Are you saying that it's inconceivable to you that an Israeli government and the Israeli people would, con would, would ever consider making peace if it meant for peace, giving up a piece of, old Jeru of East Jerusalem? Nothing is inconceivable. But one of the things, again, in Elie Wiesel's letter, he said, look, leave Jerusalem for the last. Fine. And Thanks. then we'll see. Fine. But for me, again, I believe Jerusalem belongs to the Jewish people. Not to the Israelis, but to the Jewish people. It belongs to everybody. And the fact is that let us see what happens. Um, we can talk about possibilities in the future. But what we can talk about, and I will tell you what I do feel, and I think the second part of my letter talks about the 1967 lines. That's been almost like a mantra in the, in the whole thing. Correct. Now, in the previous administrations, all of them, they talked about defensible borders. The 1967 lines, which were artificial lines, just where the war stopped. They were basically um, ceasefire lines. Basically ceasefire lines, exactly. Uh, basically, um, it's not defensible. 
Um, I've been on the 67 lines looking around, and you can't see the water from there, but you, you know it's not that far away, Mediterranean. The real aspect is, um, and there's been, there's been generals writing about it, there's been diplomats, there's been more and more people writing about the 67 lines that they're not defensible. And the concern that I have is that Israel will be forced to make a deal, make a peace deal, that would put the country as a vulnerable country. And I think that that is the greatest danger facing. And I think more than even Jerusalem, and the, the fact is that I think it's important that an administration where most of the people dealing, I'm talking about the U.S. military, most of the people dealing have never been involved in this, have never had their homes bombed, have never slept in, uh, with all the terror. Um, interesting enough, when President Obama was in Israel um, at Sitrot, and there were and there were rockets coming, uh, he said Israel should do everything they right. can to defend themselves. Yes, if, he said if his family if, were if, there, if he, he'd do everything he can. Defend. But the real aspect is, we see what happens in Sidrot when there are rockets coming into it. Absolutely. That would not be real peace, by the way. Huh. You wrote, I want to make sure everybody understands this, um, Ronald Lauder wrote, can it be true that America is no longer committed to a final status agreement that provides defensible borders for Israel? Is a new course being charted that would leave Israel with the indefensible borders that invited invasion prior to 1967? And when I read that, I asked myself, what would lead you to even ask that question? What have you seen in the Obama administration that would cause you to worry that the United States, for the first time, is no longer committed to Israel having defensible borders? And, and that is the essence of my, my questions for you today. I want you to identify for our viewers what it is that you've seen that caused you to write some of the things you wrote in this letter. So what suggests to you that America is no longer committed to defensible borders for Israel? Because everything I hear from coming out of the administration talks about the 1967 line as the line that the Palestinians would, would negotiate about. But that goes back to 2000, when Barack visited Camp David with Arafat. They were talking 67 lines. We've always heard, from as long as there's been a two-state solution suggested, proposed, that there would be some kind of territorial adjustment for the ring of settlements around Jerusalem, but that basically we were talking about pre-67 West Bank being given to the Palestinians. I've never heard anybody, I've never heard any American administration suggest otherwise. So there must have been something you've heard coming out of the Obama administration would suggest to you a different approach than, let's say, was Clinton and the two Bushes. Look, the basic question is, um, it's not what they say, it's what they don't say. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about defensible borders, which is a critical thing, and that the various administrations have talked about. They've talked about defensible borders. I can quote various presidents who've spoken about it. And that is the critical element. And you've never heard President Obama talk about Israel's security and the need for Israel to be I've heard, secure? I've heard him saying that there was unshakable bond, right. that, that they're secure. But I've never heard of him talk about defensible borders and what that means. And the question is, there's no question in my mind, for example, that President Obama has the right intent to make peace between Israel and Palestinians. And I applaud him for that. But the fact is that the, the negotiations have to be between Israel and the Palestinians. You can't have a third party taking a part in it in, a such, a, in such a strong way. I believe it has to be the Palestinians talking to the Israelis. I believe that if they are allowed to talk, and they don't have the pressures on them from the various other outside, uh, outside factors, that they can in fact find a peace treaty very quickly. Mm -hmm. I've spoken with Palestinians, I've spoken with some of the leaders, and they tell me that they could have a peace treaty within two weeks if they have certain agreements. It can be done. Then why, isn't it be, why isn't it being done? But you know, I agree with you. 
it's you know I can understand why labor negotiations might be excruciating and might take ages. I say to myself, if there really is a Palestinian leadership that wants peace, and I know that the Israelis want peace, why can't this be done? Ronald Lauder, uh, what's preventing it? I will give you the, the answer. Is very a very very simple one. Um, I think the Palestinians realize that the longer they wait the weaker Israel gets in the, in the, in the world, uh, the better deal they get. And many times I've heard, and this I've heard not directly from the administration, but I've heard from other people, saying, look, if we can't get a deal in two years, we'll impose a deal. So the Palestinians are saying, rightfully so, why should we negotiate when we can wait two years and have one imposed on them? Um, I believe that we must make it a... Israeli Palestinian talk, direct talks, and with no time limit. I do believe that Israel wants peace as much as the Palestinians. And interestingly enough. You, you think Israel wants peace as much as the Palestinians? Yes. Of course. The question is do the Palestinians want peace as much as the Israelis? I believe they do. They do. I believe they want peace also. Yes, but you're saying to me, although they want peace, they're playing a game where they hope that they'll get a better deal if they hold well, out. Well, they'll get a better peace. <laughs> from their perspective. But, 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 but you know, also interesting, um, I've had a chance to look um, at some of the areas around, uh, around the West Bank, and particularly in the Palestinian area, and um, near Nablus. The business is booming. It's double-digit double growth. Uh -huh. It's one of the few areas in the world that's growing like crazy. Yes. And people are talking about, yes, the poor Palestinians, but the potential of what can be done financially is enormous there. Mm -hmm. And the people in general, if you stop someone's dream, they all want peace, they all want to make a deal, they all want to go on with their lives. They don't want to see their children become suicide bombers. Maybe there's a few extremists. They want peace. It can be done. I've spoken with some of the people there and they want it and they're very, very rational. They understand the game. But the question is at this point, if there was not the quartet and if there was not the United States pushing and pulling, I believe if you got the Palestinians and Israelis in a room and you said, guys, make a deal, it would happen. It would happen. And the real aspect is that I believe that my letter at least opened up a question mm -hmm. and put a different type of, and also it very, very much, and interestingly enough, this is the first time the World Jewish Congress has done something like this. When I first spoke to the various people in the various countries from the Congress about this, I was, I was questioning would they, how would they feel about such yeah, a I letter. was shocked they let you do and it. And the fact is, out of 22 members, 18 said, absolutely, yes, great idea. The other four said, we'd like the letter, um, but we're not 100% sure how it would be, but it's okay. okay. But, it's, but it's interesting enough, because what they've seen, uh, here's the key question that we have to put the other piece together. What they've seen is two things. Number one, what they've seen is that because of the United States pulling back or being perceived to pull back with its relationship with Israel, there is a growth of anti-Semitism throughout, throughout, particularly throughout Europe. Um, it's growing at an astronomical rate mm -hmm. because there is a feeling that there's no longer anyone watching them. The second aspect is all countries, all countries in the world, and particularly the, the Jewish population, is concerned about uh, Iran and what's happening. And they're seeing the president not really sticking by what he said. He said that when he first was running for president, just like he said, there'll be no more, uh, I guarantee you there'll be no, um, Iran will not get a nuclear weapon or cannot get a new nuclear weapon. I hope I'm correct. I hope I'm quoting him correctly. All of a sudden, it's, I hear um, more and more that they feel it's going to be inevitable. And sanctions and no sanctions, and people are saying to themselves, this is something that worries us. And one of the parts of this letter, if you notice, we talk about Iran and the importance mm -hmm. of Iran mm -hmm. and what can be done. These are the two issues. The relationship with Israel, the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, and Iran. These are things that are making people nervous. Not only in the United States, 
and not only Jews, 70 or 80 or 90 percent of the people in the United States, when you ask them about Iran, fear Iran. And the question is, we're not addressing it. Okay. And we're allowing, and, we're, and they also <laughs> making the linkage between what happens between the Palestinians and Israelis and the rest of the Arab world is insane. Sure, they're concerned about it, but they're more concerned, 90% more concerned about what happens with Iran to them. Okay. There's so many questions that I, that I have based on what you say. You're so interesting here. I want to roll back just a moment. You talked about your concern that the United States would try to impose a peace solution to the Israeli-Palestinian yes. problem. I may be naive, so I need you to help me. Again, I'm speaking to somebody who has been in the halls of diplomacy. I can't imagine how America could impose a peace treaty between Israel and Palestine, the Palestinians, which Israel doesn't want. Well, how, how would that work? How would Israel ever tolerate it? Why would Israel ever say yes? How in your mind does that work? The concern that I have is a worldwide effort against Israel. I've seen it happen in the past. It's a very dangerous game. Led by the United States? Not led by the United States. The United States has always been the major protector of Israel. But you said you were worried the United States would impose. No? Wait, 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 wait. I was worried that, yes, I was worried the United States would impose or would do it in what they felt was the Israeli best interest. And it wouldn't be something maliciously done, obviously. But the question is, it is a dangerous game we're playing when we, when we start talking about two-year time limits. Okay, and time. What, a Netanyahu government or any Israeli government would just roll over and say, okay? No, they, they won't. But the real aspect is you can try to, I should use the word try, try to impose. It, just, I, it, it can't happen. It can't happen. But you know something else? Um, we have to look and see all the elements out there. And what can happen is not a good peace treaty. What could Israel happen? will never agree to a peace treaty it doesn't think really I keeps hope you're it secure. Right. I hope you're right. Oh, I, I, do you I, doubt it a little bit? I'll tell you something. I you, you could imagine that Israel would agree to a peace treaty it doesn't think is in its best interest? I believe that the Prime Minister Netanyahu would never agree to anything that was not in best interest. However, I don't know, because I'm not an Israeli, I don't know the sentiment of people when the going gets very, very tough, what can be done. However, I do believe that we will never reach that point. And a letter like mine um, opens up a whole dialogue. And what's interesting is that, and, I, and what's surprising me, was I thought I would get a lot of support on this letter from the center and center right. I've gotten just as many letters from the left from liberals, from people who are very liberal, they say, look, I don't agree with you on many policies. On this one, I do agree. Well, good for you. And as what I we said, found... It's, it's we, a courageous letter. And, and what we found, interesting enough, is that many people have said to me, they start off, I voted for President Obama, but I do believe, I do believe very, very much that he may not have been what I thought he would be and therefore, I, 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 they still may believe in him, but they were concerned about his, his relationship to okay. Israel. I want to talk about the process that you, you, you really, again, you courageously stepped into. And you, I was going to ask you, did you have the backing of all the other, in essence, leaders of the World Jewish Congress? You've told me basically, except for four, you did. You wrote this, our concern grows to alarm as we consider some disturbing questions. Why does the thrust of this administration's Middle East rhetoric seem to blame Israel for the lack of movement on peace talks? After all, you write, it is the Palestinians, not Israel, who refuses to nego negotiate. Your ad is reminiscent of an ad that was placed in the New York Times by the ADL in March of 2000, August 2009, after the president gave his speech in Cairo. And what I said to them then is what I now ask you. 
This is so atypical of how the Jewish community has tended to deal with conflicts between it and the president. And you already said that what bothers you is it's gone public. And in the past, it's been almost impossible to get a Ron Lauder or a Malcolm Honline or an Abe Foxman or the chairman of the president's conference to say in public on a television program, yes, we're critical of the president. Yes, we're concerned that the president is somehow withdrawing or changing the relationship between America and Israel. No matter what the problem was, in public, the Jewish establishment tended not to take this public. The Jewish you, establishment was silent. Yes, that's and correct. And the thing I even find worse is the fact that there are senators, Jewish senators in both, in both parties, many of them who have been silent. That, I think, is a okay, very important. But I want you, I want but you to, also the question I want you to answer the question. Why did you decide to break with this tradition and go public? Why? Because no one else did. Yes, but I'll say no one I else mean, did. No, no, but, but the real question is, important. it had to be said. They because, were very, why publicly, though? Why didn't you talk to President... You have the ear. You could talk to President Obama I, I, anytime I, you want. Why did you go public? I can't talk to President Obama anytime I want. You can't? No. And the administration was not hearing anything that was being said. They were only hearing a small circle around them. That's why they reached out to an organization like J Street, and they have different people. They have all these people around them are telling them a different story. The real story is the Jewish people may be liberal, may be consented, may be right, but when it comes to something like Jerusalem, they're all united. But wait, I and the real I aspect... I disagree with you, and I already said to you, it is conceivable, even for Ron Lauder, that for real peace... There would be an Arab capital in Jerusalem. And that's not the, the issue. And you and I agree. No, but, but the, the Israelis and Palestinians should work that out. It's not about Jerusalem. Your concern, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, your concern is that there is an American administration now which is not as committed to Israel as past administrations. I am concerned that this administration, although saying some very nice things about what they're about looking at the Israel security and we and we, it's our, one of our best allies, is not showing it. Mm -hmm. And what they did with Prime Minister Netanyahu, that was something that, I, that sent up a, a warning flag. Frankly, I was content to stand in the back and watch what was happening until such things I started to say, this is taking a bad turn. Now, had the Israelis done something that was outrageous, and I, I could see the, the result, but what they did to have a signed document, and frankly, I don't know how they even found out about this document. It must have been brought out by somebody. It who was announced in Jerusalem. Who, who must have been right. there to, to destroy the peace process, not to help it. I don't think and he, the real don't, aspect don't is, right. this is something that's not going to be built between us, but the reaction of the administration was something very, very concerning. To Way me. out of proportion, yes. Way out of proportion. Okay. And I said, and that was the warning shot. And I think that's the critical element. Okay. Now, it's I, all, I, it's I, all, I, want to, I want to quote something that Alan Dershowitz said, and just you react to it. Alan Dershowitz said uh, to us when I was in, doing a conversation with him, it would be terrible for the Jewish community to make an enemy of Barack Obama. Do you feel in any way going public with a letter like this or the ADL ad in some way creates now disharmony, not between uh, the American administration and Israel, but that somehow it is going to create tension between the American administration and the Jewish community here in the United States. I don't believe so. I believe that as they said, as the administration said, we can have differences. We can have differences, too. I believe that this administration, like every other administration, fundamentally has a very close relationship with Israel and will stand with Israel. But I do believe that sometimes, maybe in naivete, maybe in with other reasons, they may make mistakes that they don't realize. And the fact is, is that many of the people surrounding the president today um, Jewish and non-Jewish don't have the same views and sensitivity, perhaps, 
that they should have. Mm -hmm. And it's a concern. You say it very, very well. And the real aspect is what I'm reflecting is not my own point of view alone. I'm reflecting what I've heard over the last six months, not only in the United States, I've been through the, the whole country, but I also hear it throughout Europe and throughout the Middle East and throughout Israel. So what I was reflecting is a point of view that is said. And I thought the letter was very respectful to the president and very much saying it was written in sadness rather than anger. Yes, the tone was perfect, by the way, and, at least from uh, my perspective. Yeah, yeah. The tone was, it was perfect. It was written not in anger, but in sadness. Okay. It was trying to reach out, as they have reached out many times, I'm trying to reach out to them and say, this is what we think, this is what we feel, please don't walk away from us. I hope that they took it in that spirit. I want to come back to this original phrase you mm -hmm. used, dramatic deterioration of diplomatic relations between the United States and Israel. What's your biggest criticism of the Obama administration? I think the feeling, and this is not something my own personal feeling, this is why I hear all over, is that in the past, the administration was firmly behind Israel because they related to what the people went through because of the Holocaust, because of having to fight off six or seven Arab armies of, of a, a small underdog fighting the way. And there was always a sense that the United States was 100% behind Israel at the expense of everything else. I feel today that this administration, although behind Israel, is also very, very much looking at both sides and saying they both have their points and um, putting them on the, on the same level. And they shouldn't be put on the same level. I don't think they should be on the same level. And I think that they are two very, very different places. And I do believe that because of a, of a great deal of time in the past, uh, I think they should not be put on the same level. I think the United States should stand fairly behind Israel. And when the president makes a speech in Cairo to the Muslim world, and declines to make a speech in Israel to the Jewish world, I say something's changed. And had he gone from Cairo and then stopped in, on, in Israel on his way back and made a similar speech to the, to the, to the Jewish people, I would have said, look, I understand. But he went, he went specifically over Israel into Europe. And I find that, I found it wrong. I also found that in the speech, when he talked about Israel and the Jewish people in Israel, he was talking about the Holocaust. He was talking about destruction. He didn't mention our 3,000-year history. And I think that is a critical element. And when they talk about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is part of the Jewish world. Um, it's only been the last, I think, six, 700 years that there's been Muslims there. It's a different type of thing. Now, again... Um, there are many, many other parts to this. I believe that there are many things that Israel could do better, and I believe that a peace treaty could be made, but it's not going to be made in the same way that they're looking at it now. Okay. I want to ask you a general question, um, and just to see how Ron Lauder would advise those of us in the Jewish community. There's a well-known rabbi in Baltimore named uh, Mitchell Wahlberg, mm -hmm. and he wrote a sermon, he's, he's one of the most outstanding rabbis on the American Jewish scene, he's articulate, writes wonderful sermons. He delivered a sermon that has been widely circulated on the internet entitled, Why This Rabbi Didn't Vote for Obama and Why I Made the Correct Decision. And in the sermon, Rabbi Wahlberg acknowledges that Barack Obama has offered a measure of hope for our country that he feels that the election of a black man as president of the United States is one of the most positive and remarkable events to take place during his lifetime, and that he agrees with many of Barack Obama's domestic policies. But then he goes on to say, Israel is at the very heart of his family's experience. And it was his feelings about Israel that were uppermost in his mind when he chose not to vote for Barack Obama. 
And by the way, full disclosure, we should say, and people know this, you did run uh, as a Republican candidate for mayor of the city of New York in, a, in, a, in the primary election against Rudy Giuliani. You have been associated with the Republican Party. So I am talking to somebody who is in that, has that orientation. But in some ways, Rabbi Wahlberg puts his finger on a dilemma which has raised its head suddenly, namely the question of this. Should an American Jew who considers himself to be voting in an American election for the person who would make the best president decide to vote for that president, not based on how good the president would be for America, but for how good that president would be in his mind vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And in the past, we've been able to say the best president for America is always the best president for Israel. Here we have a different situation. And it raises the spectrum, Ron Lauder, of this question of dual loyalty. Does the American Jew, when he comes to vote for a president of the United States of America, put first on his agenda how the president, this candidate, would be president for America? Or for the American Jew committed to the state of Israel, that, concerned with its security, put Israel first in an American election? Uh, that is a very simple question to answer. 78% of the Jewish population voted for Barack Obama. In a recent poll, they looked and they say, why did you vote for Barack Obama? Israel comes out number 18 in the list. The American Jewish people voted for Barack Obama because they believed in his intelligence, they believed in his sincerity, they believed that this is a man who can move America forward. They also knew that as a oppressed people, the Jewish people, they, rela they related very, very closely to Barack Obama being the first black president. They related very strongly. And so that the answer to your question is most American Jews put, uh, put um, the United States first in a point of view. There is no dual loyalty, but there is a great concern. And the concern is for the country. The same thing is the Irish have a feeling for Ireland. Do they have dual loyalty? Or the Italians for Italy? Or whatever, whatever country you're from, or your family's from, or you have relatives there, you relate to it. It's natural. Every, every, everyone relates to the, to the country um, where their f grandparents or whatever may come from, or in the case of Israel, where, where the other, other Jewish people are. It's an important aspect. But it should not be, obviously, the deciding point. So Mitchell Wahlberg was wrong. No, he was not wrong. There were, for, the, for himself and for many people, it was a key issue. Uh, now, today, the number has gone from 78 down to in the low 50s, 53, 54. The difference is the number did not fall because of the fact that they felt his health care program was wrong or they didn't like his financial program or his, uh, he was investing in the wrong areas or he wasn't doing enough for mortgages. That 78 to 54 reflect, and this is before my letters, so I have nothing to do with it, reflect the fact of these people who voted for um, President Obama feeling an unease about his feeling towards Israel. Because when we ask the question, uh, when you ask the question from 78 to 54, where did you change? The first one up there in the largest group is Israel. So literally a third of the people who voted for Barack Obama for president have changed their point of view only based on Israel. I also believe that if that num if, if, if the administration continues doing what they're doing, that number will fall from 54 to 34 because it's the direction it's heading. And it would be the first time ever that you had less than 50% of the Jewish population voting for somebody who is not democratic. 
I cannot thank you enough for giving me so much time. Thank you. You are an extraordinary human thank being. You. And again, uh, you said you were flattered by the opening. It is only true. And mm. there are few people on the world you were seen like you. Kol tu you. Thank, you thank only you. go from strength to strength. Yeah, and I hope I always have access to you. You are yeah, wonderful you. to give me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ron Lauder. Thank you. And those were the thoughts of Ron Lauder, who is the president of the World Jewish Congress and the author of this public letter to Barack Obama. Please be in touch with me this week with any thoughts or comments you may have to the ideas expressed by Ron Lauder. And if you want to be in touch with him, you may do so by emailing me, and I will forward your emails on to him. But what do you think about some of the ideas he's expressed? Are you upset with the direction of the Obama administration? And do you feel that Ron Lauder did us a service by putting this public letter in the Washington Post and in the Wall Street Journal? Please email me or write me this week. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.